Welcome. The following video or audio are the study of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse of the King James 1611 Bible. Our family welcomes you to our household Bible ministry time. You may watch and listen with us. Our goal has been from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Each chapter by chapter we try. And topical preaching and teaching aids you can find by searching different topics. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Come and appreciate the word of God for our spiritual growth, our development in the word of God by these lessons. Please feel, feel, please feel welcome to upload and share our Bible study with family and friends. Like us, subscribe, write a comment, let us know you heard the message. The video or audio are not copyrighted and should be used and not abused. Thank you. First Thessalonians chapter 3 Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. Remember, Paul wanted to, he was at Thessalonica, he wanted to be at Thessalonica, Satan has hindered him, and sent Timotheus, Timothy, your bro I mean, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. I'm going to send Timothy to you guys to make sure who you are, to give you guys light, to refresh you, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. Whether the afflictions they're suffering or the afflictions that Paul is suffering. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. Even as it came to pass, ye know. Alright. The main frame of this message of the Thessalonica is suffering. Tribulation. Anguish. Troubles. Problems. The more you serve God, the more trouble you're going to get. Because the world hates you, Jesus said. Satan's trying to stop you. You're on a battlefield. There's no easy life as a Christian. And anybody's ever told you, you know, you receive Christ and all your troubles will be done and everything will be hunky-dory. You give the Lord $100, he'll give you 100000 They lied to you. John 8, 44. And they'll probably murder your soul by going to the lake of fire, as Christ will say to you, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. But Lord, didn't we? A mark of serving God is persecution. So Paul wants to go to Thessalonians. He can't. And he loves the Thessalonians. And he wants to see, well, how are they doing? So... If I can't go, maybe I can send Timothy, a faithful worker. He's saved. He's a minister of God. And he's a fellow laborer. So Timothy is a doer. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. Even as it came to, pa it came to pass. Not only were we just talking, it happened. And ye know about it. You know what the troubles and problems are going on. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. I want to know how you guys are standing. I want to know where you guys are. What's going on? At least by some means a tempter. And we know that Satan has tempted you. Oh, so see now he's working on them. And our labor be in vain. He's like, Satan's out there. He stopped me. He's probably working on you guys from the report I've got. You're doing. You're working. Satan is there. I know he is. The first thing that shows up when the sower goes out with the seed is Satan is devouring. He wants to know, are you guys still standing? You still got the armor on? Are you still fighting? Are you still going? I want to know. Because if you haven't, and you stop, and you're sitting down, then everything I've done is vain and worthless. 
You know, we talk about America, the great Christian nation, and it was at one time. And yet all the labor that she's done is in vain by the vanity of the churches today and the Christians today. The church has failed. Look around. But now when Timotheus or Timothy came from you unto us, Timothy went and he's come back. He's going to give a report and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity. So Timothy goes to Thessalonica. Hey, you know what? They still got the faith. And they've got not just love, they've got charity. Now that brings a smile to Paul. Paul may be in a dungeon. He may be in, you know, complete utter sloppiness of a prison. They're not like the correctional facilities of America. And in that gloom and doom of where he is, there's a light. The light is the good tidings, the gospel. I don't think that word there, good tidings, I don't think that they're just, this, you know, just chosen by the whole. I'll just put good tidings. What has been the subject of, of the three chapters so far? The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. So what does Timmy report? Good tidings. Well, what's the good tidings? That's the gospel. Good news. They're still faithful. And that ye have good remembrance of us always. You still remember who I am. Paul told one church, what? Have I become your enemy because I speak the truth? There are people forsaking Paul. There are pre people preaching against Paul. There are people who are preaching because of Paul. Paul is an outcast. Even among the churches and the Christians that he's worked and started. And he gets news that, hey, they still got you in mind. They're still praying for you, Paul. Good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also see you. So everybody wants to see each other in Thessalonica. The feeling is mutual. I don't think the Corinthian church, after reading 1 Corinthians, would really want Paul to show up. He's like, hey, you want me to show up with love or you want me to show up with a rod? Some of them would have been afraid. Hey, I, Paul's coming to town. Uh-oh. And it's that's not like, hey, Paul's coming to town. They would have been all there in the docks waiting for the ship to come in. They would have had the church meeting right there in the docks. Therefore, brethren, say people, we were comforted over you in our affliction and distressed by your faith. So persecution, affliction is happening to Paul's company. And he's getting comfort and joy by Christian acts and the faithfulness of one church. I wonder what the missionary fields are getting from the, the finished work of the church in, of America. Where America is pretty soon going to have to have the missionaries send missionaries over here. So Paul is strengthened by this church. He gives a little warning here. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Two statements. Stand fast in the Lord and we're going to continue by you staying stand fast. Stand fast is keep going. Don't quit. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? Man, we're thanking God. We're praising God for you guys. For all the joy wherein we joy for your sakes before our God. Paul is just, man, he is just excited at Timothy's report. There is just joy in his heart. And not just Paul, but everybody that is laboring with Paul. They are excitement. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face. He's praying more to go to Thessalonica than he said, Lord, I got this, I got this thorn in the flesh. I prayed to the Lord three times. God said, that's enough. Okay. Lord, I want to go to Thessalonica. Lord, I want to go to Thessalonica. Rooster grows. I want to go to Thessalonica. Moon goes down. I want to go to Thessalonica. Rooster crows. I want to go to Thessalonica. That's what he said. Night and day is his prayer. 
that ye might see your faith and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Okay, so see, they're not perfect. They are lacking. And Paul's like, I want to come there. I want to teach you. I want to help you be perfected. That is what the job of the ministers of the gospel is, to help you be to perfection. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our ways unto you. We're going to trust the will of God. We end up there. We don't. We don't. We do. We do. Paul's got a whole bunch of faithful ministers he can send. But he wants to go himself. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another. Grow more and more. Never be content with love or charity. And toward all men, unsaved. Even as we do toward you. Our abundant love for you. And we're just reading words. We, you can't understand the love that Paul has for these people. Even the carnal Christians of, of Corinth. He's like, I'm going to come there and I'm going to straighten you guys out. And not because, you know, just to be, you know, an angry, abusive, Bible thumper. No, because he wants them to do right. Paul's love for Christians is, I want you to do right. I want you to be perfected. When you get before Jesus Christ at, at the judgment seat of Christ, I want you to have more gold, silver, precious stone, and less ashes. I want you, when the Lord shows up while we're living, I want him to find you watching. And to to the and yeah, to the end, amen. And bound in our love toward you and toward all men, even as we do to you, to the end he may that he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God. And what is that? That's at the judgment seat of Christ. That's your life right now. As Job 1 and 2, when the tempter goes before God, you see that Christian there, Lord? You see that, God? You see what that Christian's doing? And God turns to the right and says, Son, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. So Satan's got to be at the left hand side. Satan's never on the right hand side. And this may be a joke, but you know why NASCAR is wrong? Because they never go right. They, you know, Christians, all that, they race on Sunday, the first day of the week. They have alcohol and tobacco on their cars. God always does right. So God would look to the right and say, son, what about that? And what Paul is teaching them, say, listen, when you sin, and we do sin, you're not perfect. You put it under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You get it cleansed. So the, the son will look over to the father and say, father. The accusations of Satan, I find no fault in them because it's under, and that would be the charge. I find no fault because if it's under the blood, God don't see it. So Satan would lose, and you would be unblameable in the holiness of God. Why? By having your sins under the blood. You realize, I don't know how often it happens, as far as my life. I don't know how often Satan goes before God and says, you see Stanley Hammer there? You see what he's doing? You see, you know, he, he, he professes to be a Christian. He professes to be witness. Did you see that sin? And that moment right there when he goes up and, and you know what? Satan doesn't need to lie when it comes to my sins. He doesn't have to make up no lies. Because I am a sinner. It is my job to put it under the blood of Jesus Christ to seek the pardon by being guilty. So when he does go before God and God turns to my lawyer, my, my advocate, Jesus Christ. So what about these charges, son? They're either unblameable before God. How? I put it under the blood of Jesus Christ. Or it's blamable. Now, how is it blamable? I have not confessed it. I have not repented of it. I have not gotten it right under the blood of Jesus Christ. So this is something that can happen right now in your life. You are standing before God either blameless or blamable. 
And when Paul says this, he's told to the Thessalonians, as you study scripture with scripture, when you do sin, repent and put it under the blood. And then either the, in another fact is like that, is that circumcision of the soul and flesh. Yeah, that flesh is a sinner, but that soul is mine. God, that's our soul. That body, God, and this is Jesus talking to the Father, that body will be redeemed one, one day, but right now, yeah, it's sinner. But that's one of ours, Father. That's a child of ours. And that's unblameable in holiness. Not just unblameable, but in holiness. You know what holiness is? You are there. God says, be ye holy as I am holy. So when you throw that word holy there with unblameable, I am equal to God. Now, I don't know if some people believe this or not, but at least one time in my life, I was holy, unblameable, and sinless. In April 1987, a Saturday afternoon, when I asked Christ to save me and wash my sins away, I was sinless. And if I would have died, I would have gone to the judgment seat of Christ at that moment, and there would be no wood, hay, or stubble. But there would be also no, no gold, silver, or precious stones. I didn't do nothing. Today, I can get with God alone, 1 John 1, 9, and have God to say, God, spill all my sins out. Now, I could be in complete repentance and doing right by the Thessalonica church, as they've done right, chapter 1 and chapter 2. And I can die sinless and be unblameable in holiness before God and have precious stone, silver, and gold. That's how important the blood atonement is. It ain't just there when we got saved and forget it. It's always flowing. Better I be not sinning. But thank God that there is a way to be cleansed from my sins when I do sin. If, if we couldn't be completely holy and completely unblameable, he would not written that. So it's possible. Before God, even our Father. Now watch that. Watch this thing again. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that? That's the rapture. We are in the third chapter of this book, and we have seen three times the rapture shown up. You know what Paul just said right there? You better watch for Jesus Christ when he comes. Because we have no idea he's coming. And when he does come, it'd be best if you be unblameable and holy. Your sins are all confessed. You are doing. You are working. You are suited up with the armor. You are going. That's how Paul wants us to appear when Jesus comes. Now, the Lord did not come during this time. He is coming. So that message will be from Paul out of his grave today to those Christians that are alive whenever the Lord does show up, whether it be my time or a future time. Paul's thing is, when the Lord comes, be unblameable and be in holiness. Because guess what, Jehovah Witness? When Jesus does come, you're going to stand before God the Father. Yet the Bible says we're going to see Jesus. He's going to meet us in the air. How am I going to see God if Jesus is standing there? Because Jesus is God and God is Jesus. How's that? That moment when we are raptured and we meet in the clouds and then we meet Jesus, chapter 4, we get to that Lord willing. We will see God and we will see Jesus together as one. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he can't be your Lord if you don't if you don't allow him to Lord over your life. It's not 
at the coming of Jesus Christ. It's at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those people who let Jesus Christ be the Lord of their life, that is how another way you're going to be unblameable and in holiness. If you don't let Jesus Christ run your life and tell you what to do, well, no one's going to tell me what to do, then you're going to be found in your sins. With, get this, all his saints. The rapture is all born again Bible believing people. Now, with not studying chapter 4 yet, a little preview of chapter 3. Chapter 4 says, They that are dead shall rise first. Those that are alive and remain shall meet them in the clouds. Okay? We'll get a big unity of the church. Everyone that is saved in the clouds. Then Jesus Christ is going to meet us in the air. And he says, all the saints together. Now, I don't know. I, I, I've been reading through the Bible. Reading through the Bible. This Bible I've, I've read since, since 2000. The marks of this Bible since 2000. Since I started recording, reading the Bible all the way through. That's not counting studying, reading the study. I don't know if we're going to know each other when we get, get I don't know when we meet in the clouds. Hey, you're my wife. Hey, you're my daughter. Hey, you're the guy I, I gave a gospel. I don't know that. But I do know one thing. Every born-again Bible-believing Christian will be there in the clouds. And then from the clouds, chapter 4, we'll get into, like I said again, Lord willing, then we get to see Jesus Christ. And not only Jesus Christ, but we get to see God. And God through Jesus and Jesus through Christ. So if you've got a religion who God is not Jesus and Jesus is not God, you've you got a religion. So, remarkable. This three chapters and three tellings of the rapture of the church. Markable.